Well, hello everybody and welcome to VatSim's Cross the Pond 2023 pilot briefing. This is for the Eastbound edition of Cross the Pond and it is a pleasure to be here with you. I am Evan. I'm the co-founder of Flight Simulation Association. I am hosting today's live presentation and I'll be joined in just a couple of moments by some experts from the VatSim community to share a little bit more about this great event. Thank you for being on and watching with us wherever you're watching in whatever chat you're watching. Let us know if you have a slot for the event. If you're flying across the pond eastbound, you've got a slot, you've got a book uh, tell us where you're going, tell us your call sign, tell us which airport city Paris, just so we have a sense that helps us out. Just drop that in the chat wherever you are watching. And for those of you who are new to Cross the Pond, new to VATSIM, new to the event, I'll give you a little background on what it is that we're talking about here today. Cross the Pond is VATSIM's largest annual event, and I think this is one of the biggest Cross the Ponds that we've done since they kind of rejigged the event a little bit and made it a bit more sustainable year on year. This year, there are almost 1,400 total pilots pilot slots, there'll be way more than 200 controllers. And what Cross the Pond is, for those who've never seen it before, is it is flying the entirety of a flight from the Americas, across the ocean, all the way over to Europe and Africa with full ATC coverage all the way along the way. So you're always talking or in communication somehow with air traffic control. And that's something that really happens only twice a year during Cross the Pond eastbound and westbound. This year's event is eastbound, so we're starting in the Americas, heading across the ocean, landing over there in Europe and and Africa. Now, for those of you who, again, are not too familiar with how this works, a couple of important points I just want to hit off as a bit of an introduction before we get started. Number one, you need to have a slot or a booking in order to participate in the oceanic portion of this event. We've worked hard to make Cross the Pond a sustainable event, by which I mean something we can do every year that isn't a crazy amount of work for the controllers involved, and that gives us a reasonable level of traffic, feeling busy, but not feeling overwhelmed. And the Cross the Pond team has been able to do that with this slot booking system. So if you have a slot, you're good. You're able to fly across the ocean. If you don't have a slot, the date to remember is October 26th. That is the day during which all of the open or unclaimed slots become available on a first come first serve basis. And so if you watch today's session, you're like, gee, I really want to fly the event. I don't have a slot. Where do I go? The answer is the cross the pond website. So CTP dot batson dot net you'll see that website come up again that's where you'll go on October 26th to be able to do that first come, first serve slot booking process. Now, if you don't get a slot, the one thing that the network is asking for this one period of time throughout the year is to please avoid flying across the Atlantic. You can fly anywhere else on the network. You can fly domestic flights. You can leave or arrive from any of the event airports. There's no restrictions on any of that. It is simply a matter of please don't fly across the Atlantic Ocean unless you have one of those 1337 slots that are set up for that purpose. I also want to point out that the Cross the Pond event is organized by a very small team of very dedicated volunteers. There's a group of people who work behind the scenes. They've been doing this for several months already, organizing those routes that you can see on the screen with me here, organizing the local VACCs that participate, putting the slots together, making this event a possibility. So I always want to recognize the work that they do, answering your questions, and really making this event a possibility. I also want to cover one of the important points that people often ask, what airplane should I fly for across the pond? People wonder, should I fly the Concorde? Should I fly maybe a, an older airplane that doesn't have nav capability? And here's the answer. We really want this event to be a success for everybody. We're trying to move 1,400 airplanes across the ocean in a short amount of time. And to do that, we really need pilots to work as a team with us, the air traffic controllers, and the network to make things possible. So we're asking you to fly a modern jetliner. Think a 767, think an A330, think an A350, a 787, that kind of thing that has navigation capability that can cross the ocean, can do RNAV SIDs and STARS. If you have updated navigation data, that's even better. We're asking you not to fly across the ocean in something like the Concorde, in something that doesn't meet modern standards, especially the Concorde. You know, I use that example because the airplane flies two or three times faster than what everyone else is doing. So if you want to fly the Concorde, you're going to get there and there won't be any controllers there because they're not set up to be there at the time that your aircraft will get there. So if you work with the network and work with the crowd and fly an airplane that is designed really for transatlantic crossings in the modern day, that is the right airplane to fly. And if you do pick anything else, it will make things a little bit more difficult for all of us. And that's why we ask you not to do that. 
I'm bringing up a couple of uh, friends on the screen here. Uh, everyone will be joined with uh, just a moment here by the two presenters who will be on the screen with us for the duration of today's session. So let me introduce to you, uh, first of all, Rob Sherman Jr. Rob, how you doing? Hey, how are you, Ivan? Thanks for I'm, having me back. I'm good. Yeah, I know. I didn't have much of a choice. I mean, I mean, uh, yes, I'm happy to have you back. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this again. Uh, for those I'm a package deal. I come with the event. <laughs> those who don't know, Rob hosts the Slant Alpha Adventures, an S3 controller in the Washington RTAC, and a longtime network pilot. Plenty of experience flying across the pond. And as Rob mentions, plenty of experience doing this briefing. I think he's been here for all of them, so he's got plenty to share on how things will work for the departure portion off of the North Americas. And then, and I guess South America, because there's two Americas. And then I'll introduce as well, Simon. Simon, how are you? Hi. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for having us along. Yes. And Simon is the vice president of pilot training at Batsim. And in that role, basically, he's working on exactly what we're doing today, trying to bridge this gap between pilots and air traffic controllers to share knowledge between the different groups and to give people a better understanding of just how everything works behind the scenes and how controllers and pilots on the network can work together to really achieve optimal results and move traffic through very efficiently. And uh, me, I'm Evan. I'm the co-founder of Flight Simulation Association. We're hosting today's presentation and co-streaming it along with the Pilot Club with Sky Blue Radio, Slant Alpha Adventures, and of course, Vatsim. So very grateful to all of those organizations for helping us spread the word and share important educational information for those of you flying across the pond. Here's what we're here to do today. Basically give everyone a better understanding of how cross the pond works by phase of flight. First starting with the departure out of the Americas, then going across the ocean, and finally tips and tricks for landing in Europe and Africa. Obviously as you move across countries, especially from the United States over to Europe, things differ greatly. And so we're really trying to highlight some of those differences for pilots who may only fly in oceanic or European or US airspace this one time a year during Cross the Pond. It'll be helpful too if you don't fly regularly on the network. These will be just great general tips for you to learn a bit more about how network flying works. But we have designed today's session for the reasonably experienced fat some jetliner pilots. So, you know, not your first flight on the network. Um, that's not to say you can't do your first flight on the network on October 28th when Cross the Pond happens. Just don't do it at one of the Cross the Pond airports. I always love to say, you know, there'll be some controller somewhere in Western United States who's nothing to do with the pond who's on at nine in the morning on a Saturday and they've got no airplanes whatsoever so that would be a great place to go if you don't have a slot or you're new to the network you want to get on the experience and just be part of the event that's a great place to be uh, the place to not be would be one of the event airports trying to do VFR closed traffic or circuits straight across the pond which invariably happens once a year and you know obviously that's just not something that uh, we can accommodate I do want to highlight as well the pilot briefing. So for everybody who has a slot here across the pond, your pilot briefing document will have everything that you need to know. We're covering general information across a wide geographic area from as far north as Canada down to South America, and then the same thing on the other side of the pond. So it's general information. It's not going to be exactly correct for everybody. The official source, the correct information, that's in the Cross the Pond dashboard pilot briefing. So once you get your route, as part of that, you'll have access to the pilot dashboard area of the Cross the Pond website. You can download a briefing for your departure airport, for Oceanic, for your arrival airport, and that has all the official information in it. So we're giving you the general, we're giving you the overview, the context, but that's where the specifics are, and make sure you have a good look if you have a slot and you're participating in Cross the Pond. Now, if you have questions, we love questions. We'd love to hear from the audience, get things a little bit interactive. So please do share those questions with us. You can drop them in the FSA chat on Discord. You can drop them in the Cross the Pond um, Discord. I'm just going to go there right now. There's a pilot briefing Q&A channel. You can put your questions in there. Or if you're watching on Twitch, on YouTube, just drop them in wherever you are. I'll be keeping an eye on those chats, making sure that everything is going well and taking all of those questions. We're going to answer those at the end. So we're going to, as soon as I pass things on to uh, Rob and Simon here, they got about 45, 50 minutes or so of content. Once they're done, I'll be back with you and we'll cover off all of those questions. Like I said, we're structured today in phase of flight. So we're starting with departure, we'll go across the ocean, and then we'll finish off with the arrival into Europe, some tips and tricks, and then jumping into the Q&A. And of course, the big disclaimer that's going to flash on the screen a couple times, this is not for real world navigation. So we are not 
telling you in 45 minutes how to fly a 777 in real life across the oceanic airspace, right? Like, we're not doing that. We are here to talk about VATSIM. We're here to talk about flight simulations. So nothing that we're saying is at all appropriate for real world use. And with that in mind, let me hand things off to Rob. And we'll start with the departure procedures out of the Americas. So, Rob, over to you. All right. Well, thank you again for having me back for, yes, this is indeed the fourth time for this presentation. I thought for sure you'd all be sick of me by now, but uh, but here I am. All right. So, yes, we're going to start about uh, departures, and that means I get to lead off here. So we're going to talk from the moment you load into your sim all the way up to cruise altitude. We'll be covering your initial clearance. We'll give you a reminder about your top altitude or your initial level off altitude. We'll talk about how to prepare to fly that departure procedure. We'll discuss pushback and taxi preparation, and we'll go over some differences in the climb instructions that you might hear depending on where you're departing from. All right, now the title of this slide, requesting clearance, a little deceiving. In the US and Canada, it's pretty likely that you won't need to request your clearance. Most likely it's gonna to come to you automatically not long after you connect. It's what's called a uh, PDC or a pre-departure clearance. It comes as a, in a text form. And on that same, it typically comes as a private message in your pilot client. So it's gonna open up in its, its own separate tab in VPilot or XPilot or Swift. Uh, the format is going to vary slightly possibly from one facility to another, but the basic format is going to look like what you see on your screen here. Uh, a couple of notes. We see this uh, this ex, ex, um, expression climb via SID. We're going to come back to that in a few slides. Note here where it says squawk 1341. In some PDCs, they'll list that as the beacon code. So you'll see beacon 1341 means the same exact thing. Uh, another note is that this PDC does not specify an expected departure runway. Some may, this one doesn't. We're going to cover that uh, uh, issue in a moment. And finally, note that it tells you who to contact next. That is very, very important. So generally speaking, you don't need to read this PDC back over the air. Entering your squawk code and activating mode Charlie in your transponder is basically acting as your acknowledgement of that PDC. And one really important tip, I recommend that you don't close that tab in your pilot client until after you're airborne. That way you can't possibly lose it before you are, are done with it. And finally, I'll note that if you are sitting there connected for 10 minutes or more and you haven't received your PDC at that point, it's probably appropriate to go ahead and check in on the delivery frequency and make sure they haven't uh, overlooked you. All right, remember how we mentioned that some PDCs don't mention an expected departure runway. Well, what do you do about that? Well, here's the next step that might help you because the next thing that you're going to, get, going to want to do is retrieve the ATIS information for your departure airport. Now, a lot of times getting it by voice doesn't always work. So I recommend you just double click the station name in the ATC list, should pop right up. Notice in this example, the ATIS indicates departing runway to two right. So at this particular airport, all departures are getting the same runway. Well, that makes life very easy for you as the pilot. In other cases, Atlanta being a key one, they may be using multiple departure runways. You might not know which of two runways you're going to be assigned. Um, so you got a 50-50 shot. The ATIS might give you an idea, but you still might not know exactly which one. Key thing to keep in mind, if there's a vital piece of information that they haven't given you, it's probably not a mistake. They've done this before. So it's most likely that it's simply, simply not this person's job to assign that uh, piece of information. So asking your delivery controller for a runway just might be wasted time. Uh, you're going to get that information from a ramp controller or a ground controller. So just be patient, put in your best guess into the FMC, be ready to adapt it to the other one if uh, you don't get the one you expected. Um, but but yeah, it's just it's it's going to end up being a wasted time on frequency if you're asking somebody to assign you a runway and it's not that person's job. All right. Moving on, let's talk top altitudes. Remember on a SID, a standard instrument departure procedure, it's more than just a string of waypoints. It, it, it's a bunch of instructions too. And one of them is an initial level off altitude, which they call a top altitude. So first of all, it means that programming the FMC is only part of the job. You actually need to be looking at the charts for all of the procedures that you're gonna be flying. In this example, the SID includes an instruction to maintain 5,000 after departure. So that's so planes that the, are departing Boston don't hit planes that are arriving at Boston. Uh, so that in instruction is very, very important. Even if your PDC or voice clearance didn't include a specific instruction to maintain 5,000, your SID does, okay? If you got cleared on the lobster seven, you've, you filed that, you got cleared on it, you've agreed to do it. 
So then that includes that 5,000. You agreed to follow that instruction. They don't have to say it to you again. It's redundant. You've already agreed to it by virtue of being cleared and uh, acknowledging this SID. Another very important tip, read all of the notes on that SID. There's some really fun gotchas in the notes on some SIDs. O'Hare is like notorious for that. And your FMC might not follow those instructions by default. So you got to read through all the notes on that SID. You can't just put the pr procedure in the FMC and expect that your job there is done. One important distinction is that some SIDs are pilot nav, which, which we also call RNAV off the ground. And that literally means your SID tells you how to join the route starting the instant you leave the runway. Other SIDs, though, you're going to fly a certain heading or make a certain turn, and then you're going to wait for vectors to join your route. And you need to know which type of SID yours is. One thing that's not typically on the chart in the uh, Western Hemisphere, at least, is that there's a pretty universal speed limit, 250 knots, until you climb past 10,000 feet mean sea level. For a very heavy aircraft with heavy loads, you might need a little faster. It's called the minimum clean speed. Uh, I think, and, and this is a little bit deceiving, I think technically if you maintain 250 or your aircraft's minimum clean speed, you're not required to tell ATC. But if that minimum clean speed is higher than 250, it's probably nice to let them know just for their planning purposes. One key difference between North American SIDs versus SIDs elsewhere is that most North American SIDs contain a number of different paths depending on which departure runway you've been assigned. Uh, outside of North America, that's different. You typically would just get a whole different version of the SID that's geared toward each departure runway. But uh, over on our side, we have one procedure typically that, that covers it all. So when we review the SID, it's very important that we check it against the legs page to make sure that the points are correct based on which runway you have selected. So while you're doing that, you want to compare the altitude and speed restrictions to what's in the what's in the box. Well, I whenever time I say, I'm like, what's in the box? What's in the box? So here's boat at 4,250 knots. And you want to make sure that, that all the points uh, along the way and is the associated altitude and speed restrictions imported correctly. So uh, you've done, done that on the legs page. It's not also a bad idea to flip over to that plan view too. And, and this is more like a visual check, the shape of the route, that kind of that J-shaped route is the same as this J-shaped route in your FMC. So this is looking pretty good. Uh, before we flip to the next page, one more thing to point out is this, uh, this is the Highland SID out of Boston. Uh, this is a uh, pilot nav or RNAV off the ground one. So let's compare that now to this one. This is the Jacoby out of uh, Dulles. Now, Dulles is not a departure field this time around and crossed upon, but this type of departure exists all over. We had this slide in from last time, and it, it illustrates the point pretty well, so we left it there. Uh, note here that there's not a depicted path from the runway to the first point of Riggins. So this is what we call a hybrid seat. It does have a depicted path on it, but it doesn't tell you how to join that path. How you join that path is actually up to the controller. And if we were to look up the text description here, it will literally say for vectors to Riggins. So the controller is going to tell you how and when to get to that point Riggins. Don't, don't, don't. Just turn off, uh, take off, and then turn toward Riggins on your own. That's a good way to hit somebody. Uh, the plan view you can see here depicts that 320 heading. So in this particular uh, case, we've selected runway 30 for departure, and you can see that it has you turn to 320 and maintain that. Uh, straight on till morning until you're told otherwise. And that's what the FMC uh, depicts. You don't want to go messing with closing up that gap in the route unless you're absolutely certain you're going to keep the plane in a heading mode and don't let it turn toward Riggins until you're told. Okay. Moving on to pushback and taxi. A lot of times in North America, we say that push and starts the pilot's discretion unless you're pushing onto an active taxiway. Now, across the pond, on the other hand, Bit of a different animal because we have we as the controllers have a schedule to try and meet as best we can. We're going to try and get you out at a specific time, so you need to contact somebody before you push, not only for your slot time but to make sure you're not impeding somebody else from their slot time. So, uh, who you contact might be different depending on the airport. It might be a delivery controller, might be somebody that's logged on as called ramp or metering. Um, who it was was listed in that PDC that you got a couple slides ago and I told you to keep that tab. Don't delete that tab because now you need to look back and say, oh, wait a minute, there's four, five, six uh, ground controllers here. Which one am I supposed to call? That PDC told you. Before you call for push though, you do want to make sure your APU is already up and running, your tug's connected, you're basically ready to pop the brakes and roll immediately. So once you start pushing, um, 
the other thing is to, is that you typically don't have to ask for engine start on our side of the pond. That's it's pretty much implied if you're pushing, you're starting. Yeah, we're fully um, ready. We're waiting for the jet bridge and the APU and, <laughs> and all yeah, that. yeah. We're fully oh, ready. Man. Is that yeah? Yeah. That that's that's the phrase that we that we hear east side of the pond. We don't typically use that as terminology on the west side as much, but that's what we're saying. Is basically when you when you call for your clearance, that, that release the brakes and roll, man. Um, where do I leave off? When you start it up, uh, your flight controls are checked. You're ready to roll. Uh, time to go ahead and call for your taxi with your location, with the current ATIS letter. And then when you're taxiing, one very key important thing, this happened to me just last night. Uh, I was flying in a Friday night ops event and the taxiway letters in Microsoft Flight Sim 2020 were, were assigned just arbitrarily. They did not match what was on the chart at all in any way, shape or form. So go by what's on the chart. Don't go by the signs on the ground in your sim. They may be off. The chart is what the pilot, the controllers are going to go off of as far as assigning your taxi route. So you might not be able to rely on the letter of taxiway that you see. You might just have to go, okay, obviously it's down here. It's the third left, and then it's the right turn before I get to the runway. So that kind of thing. Just go by what's on the chart. Um, finally, you don't want to switch to the tower until you're told, but more importantly, you need to know the difference between contact the tower and monitor the tower. If you're told to monitor, that means switch over and wait. Don't say anything. Wait for them to call you. Contact means switch over. Let them know that you're on the frequency. Monitor means switch over. Don't say a word. If you're told to monitor and you switch over and you say, tower, Southwest 123, we're on the channel monitoring, that's a contact. That's not a monitor. That you just destroyed the whole purpose of reducing the, the frequency congestion by telling them that you were a monitor. Does you don't have to tell them you're monitoring. Monitoring means just listen. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the climb instructions. And this is this one's going to get a little tricky because there's some different variations of how the climb instructions work depending on where you're departing from. Uh, in this first example, we're departing from Canada. And let's say our initial clearance was via the dead key for departure flight planned route. They didn't say anything about an initial altitude. Well, they didn't have to. Remember, it's in the SID. So you're going to maintain 5,000. You don't have to worry about the rest of these restrictions until you're told to climb higher. For right now, you're maintaining 5,000. At some point, they're going to jump in and say, for example, uh, climb 1, 3,000. So now these individual restrictions along the way do have to be met. You got Toronto at or above 6,000. You got to stay at or, below, uh, at or below 7,000 at Halifax, and then you got to make sure you hit this point called Gander at exactly 10,000 feet, and then you continue up to the 1-3, the 13,000 that you were cleared to. The basic philosophy in Canada is that the restrictions on the SID continue to apply unless you're specifically told, specifically, not specifically, specifically told to ignore them. And here's that is here's how that would sound. It would see you would hear climb unrestricted one three thousand. So now you're just going to climb immediately to thirteen, ignoring all of these altitudes, uh, Toronto, Halifax, and Gander. Um, the interesting thing is, if there were speed restrictions at any of these points, you would now be ignoring those too, because unrestricted literally means unrestricted. No restrictions continue to apply. You just now head straight to your new assigned altitude. All right. Now, in the U.S., the philosophy is a little bit different. So here they are going to tell you to meet the vertical restrictions on the SID, and they're literally going to do that by saying climb via the SID. So what does that mean? That means now that your initial level off altitude is going to be 10,000 because that's what's on the SID. And on the way, you'll need to make sure that you cross this point called VATSIM at or above 5,000. You got to stay at 7,000 or below as you come under this point called Ocean. And then when you cross Pond, you should be reaching 10,000 exactly and holding that altitude by that point and then you stay there until you're cleared higher this is a little variation on that this is climb via sit except maintain 8000 so you're going to ignore the top altitude of 10000 that's now been overridden you're going to continue to abide by the points at vatsim because you're climbing via the sit up until that point so 5000 or higher at vatsim hold that 7000 until after crossing ocean now you can pretty much ignore that 10,000 at Pond because you're holding 8,000, which uh, overrides that instruction. And then you just stay at 8,000 until you're cleared higher. In the U.S., the one thing to keep in mind is that climb and maintain is an altitude clearance that cancels your previous altitude clearances. 
So you just go to the new assigned altitude, but that does not mean the same thing as unrestricted because speed restrictions are treated separately here. Climb and maintain doesn't do anything for speed. So whatever restrictions you had on speed still apply there. Again, this is in the U.S. So for example, now you're crossing that sim at or above 5,000, you're told to climb and maintain one 2,000. You can now disregard the limit of seven at ocean and 10 at, at pond. If there was a speed restriction like 230 at ocean though, that still counts. <laughs> it's, it's a little confusing, but just think of it as U.S. altitude clearances and speed restrictions are just, they're just in two completely separate buckets. And don't worry, if you're confused now, it's all right. We'll do our best to confuse you. Oh, even Simon's going to be chasing his tail the whole rest of this presentation. So if you believe me, I'm giving you the easy stuff. <laughs> uh, speaking of the easy stuff, well, this is the next topic, a perfect segue, Simon, because uh, let's, let's talk transition altitudes. I definitely have it easier than you on this one. Um, but in North America, our transition altitude is not listed on any chart anywhere. Why? Because it doesn't have to be. Our transition altitude is 18,000 feet mean sea level all day, every day, 365 days a year, even on Christmas. So there's no flight level 050, flight level 100, or even flight level 175. Those things don't exist on our side. Everything below 18,000 is stated in terms of thousands and hundreds of altitudes, and you continue to do that calibrated to the local altimeter. That's the key difference between an altitude and a flight level is whether you're on a standard altimeter or the local altimeter. Stay on the local below 18 on our side. Uh, my, I think it's my last topic is gonna be cruise altitudes. Um, even, and by the way, even experienced VATS and pilots get this part messed up for cross the pond. So experienced VATS and pilots, if you've tuned out, tune back in, please. Um, when you book your slot on the Cross the Pond website, and then later this coming week when you get your route, which will be the night before or the morning of, there's a cruise altitude associated with the oceanic crossing. That's the highest altitude that you're able to make at the oceanic entry point. That's what's in that booking. What you should file in your flight plan as you connect that morning is not that, and it's not your highest cruise altitude. It's the first cruise altitude that you want to be cleared to after you depart. So, and, and for pretty much everybody, that's going to be an odd number thousand as you're pretty much all going to be going eastbound. So once you get over the ocean, you could very well be getting an even or an odd altitude for your oceanic crossing, but pretty much everybody's going to be on an odd altitude. And what you put is not that final cruise that you're going to be at nice and light later in the flight, but that initial cruise that you're going to get cleared to once you get out of your departure airports terminal area. So very important to keep those distinctions in mind and file the correct altitude in your flight plan. Uh, once you get up to that initial cruise, there's gonna come a time later where you're gonna need to change cruise altitudes. Um, your initial cruise, like I said, it might be different than your oceanic cruise or your FMC might want you to do a step climb for better fuel efficiency or later on your FMC is gonna tell you it's time to start descending. You may not, may not in any way, shape or form do any of those things without clearance to do so by air traffic control. That little box in your, you know, by your, your right hip doesn't know what the traffic situation is around you, doesn't know whether it's it's safe to climb or descend from where you are now. So you gotta make sure you've requested any altitude changes and be sure that you've been approved to make those altitude changes by the controller. And also understand that there might be times that they cannot approve it for traffic reasons. All right, Simon, I'm going to turn things over to you here. Please welcome back to the mic, Vat Sims, Vice President of Pilot Training, Simon Kelsey. Simon, your airplane, my friend. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, I have control. Yeah, and this is my uh, first time doing this. So uh, I know uh, Rob and uh, Evan hopefully will uh, see me through and look after me all the way through. Um, so in this section of the presentation, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the oceanic facilities that are involved in cross the pond that you might be speaking to, how we're going to enter oceanic airspace and some op uh, oceanic operations and best practices for making sure you stay on track when you're crossing the pond. We'll also look over the other side of the pond as well and what we're going to do there. So here's a quick glance over some of the facilities involved. And as you can see, it is pretty blooming big this year. Uh, 
our biggest cross the pond ever, I think, I'm right in saying. Every facility involved from Reykjavik in the north all the way down to uh, Johannesburg Oceanic in the south. Uh, so really great to see all of those facilities involved. Basically, every facility that's involved across the Atlantic at you know, all points. So really fantastic. Now, before we get into oceanic operations properly, as it were, a little word about oceanic routes, because they might look a little bit different to what you might be used to if you're used to flying domestically. So I'll put an example up here. Uh, this is a pretty typical looking uh, route that you might see on the North Atlantic. Um, so there's no airways. We've got an entry point here, which is OMSAT, where we're going to enter the oceanic airspace. We've got a whole bunch of coordinates. And then on the other end, we have an exit point, ADARA. Um, and the question is, uh, how are we going to put that into our navigation system, into our FMS? Because we don't often see these. They do occasionally pop up into a domestic routes from time to time, but we don't see them very often. And the answer is, uh, it will vary depending on what sort of FMS, what equipment you have. Um, there's a couple of ways. Uh, there is a long form way, uh, which enables you to put basically any coordinate into your FMS uh, anywhere in the world, uh, depending on your aircraft type will depend on how you are going to be able to do that. Uh, there's some examples there for Boeing and Airbus. Uh, have a look up for your um, aircraft type. Uh, or alternatively, there is a short form, which is basically a database waypoint. So uh, just as your navigation database contains uh, points such as OMSAT, for example, or ADARA, and associates those with a set of coordinates, uh, likewise, uh, there are a set of short form waypoints uh, which are associated with these common latitude and longitude points that you might see uh, on uh, oceanic operations. And the format that this works in is up on the screen there. Um, so you'll see, essentially, we've got a combination of letters and uh, the cardinal point. And where we put this uh, letter, in this case, uh, N for um, uh, it depends on the where in the which hemisphere the point appears in. So, for example, 47 north, 50 degrees west, uh, we would enter as 4750 November, as in this uh, format here. So nice and straightforward. But do beware, because as you will notice, if you're astute from looking at uh, this little graphic, uh, entering the wrong letter or entering the letter in the wrong place uh, is going to completely change the location of the waypoint that you have entered. So, for example, uh, let's say we're yeah we're trying to enter 47 degrees north, 50 degrees west, and we think, how are we going to put it? Oh, I knew it's something like uh, it's uh, 47, uh, 50, uh, 50 degrees west. Okay, we'll put that in. Um, and that's going to create a point that is not somewhere up here as we were intended, but in fact at south 47 degrees, uh, west 50 and uh, the same is true if we put the you know the letter in the wrong place or something like that so it is very well worth doing a quick gross error check making sure that you've got that um those points in correctly if you are entering them manually yeah why does my route say it's eight thousand miles it's only supposed to be four thousand miles <laughs> exactly that yeah so a gross error check events you know your fms and against what you've got in your flight plan is a insufficient really, fuel and, I'll, I'll be fine oh yeah why is that um, and here's an example of what that route would look like in the entered into the FMS. This is an Airbus uh, example here. So you can see our entry point there is OMSAT, and then we've got 4750, 5040, etc. So if you're used to flying domestically, oceanic flying might feel a little bit daunting, but don't worry because I'm going to break it down for you. And basically, we're going to cross the Atlantic in three easy steps. Firstly, we're going to obtain an oceanic clearance if we need to. And actually, we don't necessarily always need to. A bit of a common misconception. So we'll get onto that in a bit. Uh, secondly, we're going to organize communications with an oceanic area control center and continue to do so as we cross multiple ones of those. And finally, we're going to fly our clearance whilst maintaining communications and the key bit there is flying our clearance because it's not necessarily what we might have filed but we need to make sure we file we fly uh, what we're cleared for 
So you've probably heard about the concept of an oceanic clearance before. It's something that's separate to your airways clearance that you would have got on the ground at your departure airfield in that PDC that uh, Rob was talking about earlier on. So when do we need an oceanic clearance? And the answer is it's only before we enter what's called the NAT North Atlantic high level airspace, which for our purposes for cross the pond is Shanwick, Gander and Reykjavik. Uh, basically every other facility, your clearance will be coordinated in the background. So if you're entering via New York or one of the other oceanic uh, area control centers, you don't actually need to get a specific clearance yourself. It will all have been done for you in the background. But if you are entering via Gander or Reykjavik, uh, as we're going um, eastbound this year, uh, then you would need to uh, obtain a clearance. And we'll talk about how to do that now. Why do we need to get a clearance? Uh, well, it's because fundamentally we're going to an environment with very little uh, radar, with uh, limited communications facilities. And so the concept is that we need to organize everybody at the start and provide them with separation all the way across. Your oceanic clearance will cover all the oceanic FIRs or facilities that you're going to pass through. You only need to get one before you enter the first oceanic control center. And uh, basically three quick steps to get a clearance. Firstly, we're gonna get the information we need together. We're going to request our clearance and finally we're going to receive our clearance, hopefully. So uh, prior preparation prevents poor performance. So make sure you get everything that you need together, which is good airmanship in general. Just make good use of time. Try and make the best use of time you can to ensure you've got everything prepared, everything in the right order, easily to hand, all that sort of thing. And this is what we're going to need. So we're going to need our route, obviously, our assigned track, which will be provided to you as part of your pilot briefing on the route. Our estimated arrival time at the oceanic entry point, that's our first waypoint in oceanic airspace. Uh, the level that we're requesting for the oceanic crossing, Rob mentioned this earlier, so you'll again be provided with the flight level uh, for the crossing as part of your oceanic, uh, as part of your cross the prom briefing. The maximum level you can achieve at the entry point, right? Uh, Every plan on paper is great, but no plan survives first contact with the enemy, right? So yeah, occasionally things might need to be a bit flexible. <laughs> uh, so you, yeah, what 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 was put down on paper may need to be amended. So uh, by providing ATC with that maximum level that you can achieve at the entry point, it gives them that ability. The speed you want to cross and the TMI, the track message identifier, which should be provided with the uh, with your briefing pack. And it's basically just a code so that ATC know that when you talk about track alpha, you're talking about the same track alpha, for example, that they are. A um, couple of points about this, really important uh, that we get the correct time. So uh, if you, uh, unless, unless you really love maths, right? I don't really love maths. Uh, Rob, um, you may feel slightly differently, but... <laughs> um, it's, I do all those calculations uh, manually, so I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. So uh, unless you really want to be sat there kind of totting up time and thinking, ah, oh, do you know what? Well, the real time now is this, and I've just got my sim set to that. So actually, you know, the sim says it's going to be that time, but actually it's going to be that time in real time. Just set your sim to real time. It's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, and real time is really what ATC are going to be interested in. Um. How are we going to get our request, uh, clearance? Well, in real life, we generally send it over CPDLC. More on that to come, uh, friends. Um, and the way we do that in VATSIM is we use a system called NatTrack. So uh, we don't have to clog the radio up with a voice clearance and sit there transcribing it, all that sort of stuff. Um, we need to request a clearance 30 to 45 minutes before we enter Gander or Reykjavik. Uh, this is slightly different to real life, but it's a request from the Cross the Pond uh, team, basically, to make sure that those ETAs are as accurate as they possibly can be. And if you're departing from an airfield which is less than 30 minutes from oceanic airspace, basically you need to request your clearance as soon as you possibly can once you're airborne and you've got a sensible ETA for that entry point. The link's on the um, slide there, and I'm sure uh, Evan will put it up in the comments, or there'll, there'll be somewhere you can click on it as well. Um, 
here's the form. Uh, I won't go through it in vast detail. You'll only see the full form if you're logged into the network as a pilot. Some of the information on here will be pre-filled for you based on your flight plan and your connection details. The rest of it, you'll have to uh, fill in yourself. Just take your time over it. Make sure that what you put in is accurate because uh, if you realize you've made a mistake when you once you've sent it off, it becomes a real faff to try and go back and send another one off. It gets confusing. Um, once we've sent our clearance off, this is what we're going to get back. Um, and we can see it's actually really handy because we've got our clearance that we requested down at the bottom here. And then this is our message uh, that we've got back from ATC. It'll take a little while to process, uh, maybe a couple, you know, three, four, five minutes, something like that. And you can see that uh, a couple of things to highlight are that you'll see a couple of these lines have got a forward slash in front of them. And these are to highlight some things have changed from what we request. So for example, uh, we've uh, been given a restriction to cross our entry point, Porty, that's after 1423. So we'd need to think about how we amend our speed for that. Um, we've got a, a change to the speed for the crossing that we requested. So we requested Mac decimal eight two. We've actually been cleared at Mac decimal eight one and our flight level for the crossing has been changed as well. Important to note that this is not a clearance to change your level and speed uh, and stuff like that right now. Um, when you're still talking to a domestic controller, you need to liaise with the controller that you're speaking to, um, the domestic controller, uh, to obtain the level changes or speed changes that you need in order to be at the entry point at that level and speed. And if you do have an issue with NatTrack, if you've sent your clearance off, you haven't had anything back after, I don't know, 10 minutes, something like that, uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, then um, do be a little bit patient, but you can always speak to your current domestic controller who will be able to do a bit of co coordination for you in the background. On the subject of um, uh, clearances, and we mentioned fly your clearance earlier on, uh, good moment to have a chat about route checking. And this is something which is really important in real life and is really important for us as well on Cross the Pond Day because, as you can imagine, really busy day. If we get things wrong, we're going to start causing problems. And here's a stat for you. Uh, last year, 2022, there were 38 gross navigation errors. Uh, and this is when an aircraft is off track by 10 nautical miles or more, which is quite a long way. Uh, and that's and, and in I only life. did 36 of those. I don't know who the other two were. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, it's uh, something which the professionals can absolutely get wrong. Uh, so if the professionals can get it wrong, we sure can if we're not careful and we're not vigilant about it. So um, once you've received your clearance, do take your time to make sure you check it against your flight plan and what's entered into your flight management system. And I'm going to give you a real world procedure, a tip that is used, you know, procedure that's taught to pilots in real life to do that. So our first step would be to check your clearance that you've received in your NatTrack message or your message from the NatTrack system there against the flight management system. So you're going to check the entry point matches up each waypoint matches up and the exit point matches up and check your flight level and Mac number. And you can amend, if you can amend that in the FMS, so it's, it's there, great. And that'll help give you better predictions as well. Once you've done that, uh, you can then check the FMS against your uh, operational flight plan, your computer flight plan navigation log that you get out of Simbrief or something like that. Now, I know obviously uh, we're not necessarily going to print the flight plan off for every flight we do in the sim, but if you're going to do it, I'd suggest Cross the Pond Day is a great day to do it. It's a really useful thing to have to hand to be able to reference and uh, look, look at, look ahead, scribble things down on. And once we've checked each waypoint, uh, in the so that each waypoint in our oceanic segment, once we've checked the FMS and checked it uh, there on the flight plan, we're just going to put a little circle next to it like that, and you'll find more about that in a moment. Um, so we've got our clearance. We're now about to enter oceanic airspace. So we need to organize communications with the oceanic area control center. And the way we're going to do that is Fundamentally, we're going to do a cell call check, and I'll we'll talk in more depth about cell call and what it is in a moment if you're feeling blank, but just stick with me for now. 
and this is how we're going to do it. So uh, my glamorous assistant uh, <laughs> is going to uh, play the part is, is, of the is going to do his best to channel Gary on this. So absolutely, <laughs> Ganda Radio, Ganda Radio, Speedbird Four Seven Charlie, Shandwick next, requesting self cow check on Bravo Papa Charlie Hotel. Uh, Gary's going to love that. Uh, and so there's our uh, request, and uh, ATC are going to respond something like, uh, Speedbird 47 Charlie Gander Radio, stand by for cell call check. Now, what do we do when we're told to stand by? We say nothing, right? We just keep quiet because responding, yep, standing by is not what we're expected right. to do. It's going to get in Red the Red 5, standing by. Yeah. Uh, so uh, hopefully what's going to happen now is ATC are going to send a cell call uh, message out over the frequency and your pilot client is going to detect that and it's going to ping and flash up in your V pilot client, right? And when you do so, you're going to respond. Cell call received or cell call check okay, whatever. Acknowledge exactly. It is, but... And once we've got that, uh, if you wish, now you've done that, you have established communications and that's it you are checked in all you need to do now if you want to you can turn the radio volume down notice i've said down not off or tune to a different frequency don't do that stay on the frequency but you can turn the headset down if you want to or take your headphones off or whatever it might be um so uh obviously though if you do receive a cell call alert later on uh, you have to put your headphones back on and respond to atc and we're not going to switch frequencies away and we'll find out why in a moment. Um, oh, one other thing. Uh, so a couple of other things, actually. So every time we switch frequencies, so if we get handed off to a new oceanic uh, area control center, then we need to conduct a new cell call check because we've changed frequencies. It's changed, so we need to make sure that it still works on the new frequency. And uh, also, we need to squawk 2,000 10 minutes after we enter oceanic airspace. This is a new thing. It's changed. It used to be 30 minutes. It's now 10. And I've forgotten that every time. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, easily done. Um, so uh, as we talked about cell call a little bit there. If you're looking at me blankly and thinking, what is this cell call thing that you're on about? Uh, Basically, it stands for selective calling, and it's a system that allows ATC to alert an aircraft that they want to talk to them. Why would they want to do that, you ask? Well, have a listen to this. Well, that sounds pretty horrible, doesn't it? And that is a recording of real world Gander radio. Uh, so, and you can hear it's all horrible hiss and crackle. And that is what it sounds like because of the high frequency radio that is used for those long range communications. Um, so long range, but the quality is awful, like your crackly AM radio. And as you can imagine, it'd be pretty fatiguing to listen to for four and a half, five hours across the Atlantic. Um, so the system works, basically each aircraft has a four letter code. It's not unique. Uh, there's only a limited number of these codes. So they do get reused amongst aircraft when in real life, they try to assign them to aircraft that are unlikely to be in the same bit of airspace, but it doesn't always, uh, it's not always the case. Um, and eat that four letter code, each of those groups is associated with a tone. You heard some actually in that transition uh, transmission that I played for you. And uh, when your radio system detects the tones that's associated with your code, you'll see here it is in the uh, pilot client. So when you connect to the client, make sure you put your cell call code in there. Uh, then the radio alerts the crew basically. Uh, so if the cell call system's working, you can completely turn the radio down. And if ATC want to contact you, they'll send you a cell call. Obviously, again, you have to remain tuned to the frequency. The tones get sent over the frequency. If you're tuned to a different frequency, it's not going to work. And you're going to get some unwanted attention from some fighter jets or something like that in real life. Um, really important cross the pond note. Uh, you must use the cell call code that is provided in your booking. So not the code that's associated with the airframe that you're flying in real life, for example, uh, but the one that's been provided to you in your booking um, so that everything matches up there. Make sure you put it in your um, cell call code box on your pilot client. 
And finally, uh, as far as Oceania is concerned, uh, we need to, but now, once we've organized communications, we've entered the air, oceanic airspace, we now need to fly our clearance and maintain communications. So what are we going to do uh, as we're coming up to a waypoint in oceanic airspace? We could be snoozing with our feet up, but, you know, you know watch, reading the crossword, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Rob. You know, quite long, yeah. yeah, I'm jamming along the Taylor Twist or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but remember those uh, stats about gross navigation errors, right? So... Don't let it happen to you. Take your time just to be a little bit uh, disciplined about making sure that everything's working. So this is what would, crews would be doing in real life when they're coming up to a waypoint. A couple of minutes before, uh, so let's say we're coming up on 52 North 40 West here. Um, we would make sure that our next waypoint is correct. Make sure that it's the next thing in the FMS. It's on the nav display. The magenta line's heading off in the right direction. All that kind of good stuff. And once we've done that, we're going to put a little slash through the circle we drew earlier uh, next to that next waypoint uh, to verify that we've checked that. And then once we pass the waypoint, uh, we're going to sit up, pay attention, make sure that the waypoints sequence correctly so that 50 North, 50 West becomes active. Uh, the aircraft turns towards, starts tracking towards that waypoint. Uh, we might want to note down our time overhead uh 52 north 40 west and update our estimated time of arrival at the next point and note those down on our flight plan and then we're going to put a second slash through our um circle there to confirm that we've completed our kind of waypoint crossing procedures we don't need to do position reports anymore those are not required atc have got more modern ways of downlinking our position essentially these days um, so once we've done that we're happy the aircraft's tracking towards the next uh, waypoint great you can put your feet up i'll go back to my crossword rob will put taylor swift back on and uh, away you go for another 35 40 minutes or so um, so that's the oceanic side of things, and we're going to move on now to what we do once we get over to the other side of the pond uh, to ICAO and European operations. So we're going to have a little chat about CPDLC, um, about how stars work, and uh, some descent and approach procedures and tips. Now, I'm aware that Rob and I are delivering a whole load of information really quickly. And in fact, I should be delivering it a bit quicker than I am probably. Um, so uh, if you only remember three things from today's session, here are the things I want you to take away. Uh, firstly, double check the procedures that you've got loaded. Um, because if you're used to flying in North America, where everything's pretty much set in stone, over this side of the pond, it's very likely that the procedures will be different depending on which runway is in use in terms of, for example, your star. Never start a descent without authorization. Rob mentioned this earlier on. As far as climbs are concerned, the same is true as far as descents are concerned. doesn't matter what the FMS says, your top of descent marker, uh, the count on the keyboard, whatever it might be, your top of descent doesn't know about the other traffic, right? So make sure ATC have cleared you to change level. And as Rob also alluded to, the transition level can vary and does vary wildly. Uh, so make sure you check the charts and the ATIS to make sure you know where to switch. And we'll talk about where to find that in a moment. Quick word about CPDLC then. This is text messaging for aeroplanes, okay? And it's something which is uh, ubiquitous in real life across Europe and a lot of other places, less so in the States, although I think it's starting to get there a little bit. Um, some aircraft have got direct integration using the Hoppy system. You might've heard a little bit about this, your Phoenixes, your FS Labs, things like that. Uh, there is also an option if your aircraft doesn't have uh, Hoppy integration and it's a really cool, lightweight, totally free program called ECCPDLC. And you can download it as a link there. As I say, I'm sure Evan will put a link somewhere else as well. Um, so CPDLC is um, really important to mention that uh, voice is still the primary means of communication. So CPDLC is a supplement, not a replacement for voice communication. And let's have a little look at how we're going to do this. So we're cruising along uh, and we want to talk to Canary Ass Controls. We found the um, identifier in the controller info as we looked at there. And we're going to click log on. We're going to type in the code and we're going to send off our clearance, uh, our log on request to uh, Canary Ass Control. The controller is going to see that. It's going to see that uh, Iberia 8946 wants to initiate CPDLC with us. 
And in a moment, hopefully they're going to see that and respond. And there we go. Uh, so it says current ATC unit, CCRI, Canary S control. Great. We're now logged on. We're connected. We've established our CPDLC connection. So we received a message here, a, an instruction, in fact, to climb to flight level 360. You can see a couple of mouse clicks. We'll code. That's it. That's our interaction with ATC done. And we can now go in and update uh, our uh, level. If we want to request uh, something, uh, for example, we want to request a shortcut or something like that or a different level, we can do that. Uh, so, for example, we want to request a direct to this point roster, a little bit of a shortcut here. Um, we can go into the menu, request direct, type in the waypoint that we want roster. We can give a reason if we want to, and we're going to send it off. And ATC again are going to see that. They're going to say, you know, either unable or they will respond with, ah, there we go, great news, we've been cleared to proceed direct to roster. So again, same principle, just a couple of mouse clicks, we'll co, uh, that's it, ATC are going to receive that acknowledgement, know that we've seen it, and we can go plan, uh, plugging that into our FMS. Some of your aircraft with integration, like your FS Labs, for example, you can actually uplink those um, messages, those, those directs and things like that directly into the FMS. Um, so it cuts out some of that opportunity for error and things like that. As you can imagine, it also really uh, cuts down on the amount of frequency time that's used. It allows messages to be transmitted really quickly and easily, accurately, and it keeps the frequency clearer for important communication. So as I say, remember, we do still have to be listening uh, and monitoring the frequency because anything that's important or urgent will always come over voice because CPDLC isn't quick enough for things that are not routine like that. Rob mentioned the transition uh, altitude. As we said, uh, in the in Europe and most of the rest of the world outside North America, the transition altitude will vary from airport to airport. You can find it on the charts. I've got some examples here of where you can find the transition altitude, like on the Jefferson charts here for um, Gatwick. And like most things that are really important, Jefferson make it really small in like size six font and tuck it out of the way so you can't see it. Um, or in this example below, uh, the charts you might get from something like Chart Fox, the state produced charts for Amsterdam. In this case, you could see the transition altitude for Amsterdam is 3,000 feet. Um, transition level is what we're mainly concerned with because we're arriving into Europe. It's the lowest usable flight level above the transition altitude. And because of that, it will vary depending on the pressure quite often uh, to make sure you're properly separated. It will be in the ATIS for the airport you're arriving at. The most important thing is that we have our altimeter set correctly. So if we're on a flight level, as Rob mentioned, we need to be on standard pressure. If we are on a uh, an altitude, uh, then we need to be on the local QNH, which will almost certainly be in hectopascals, HPA, uh, not uh, inches of mercury. Um, stars, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, in Europe and most of the rest of the world outside North America, uh, stars are usually assigned by ATC as opposed to being filed in the flight plan. And the reason for that is because they are usually runway dependent. So, for example, you can see on the screen here, we've got an example of a couple of arrivals, the PSAP arrival into Dusseldorf. And you can see that for the uh, 05 runways, uh, our route takes us initially in this southerly direction, whereas for the 23s, uh, we start at PSAP and we go off in an uh, easterly direction. So you can see how if we got that wrong, if we put the wrong one in, we'd cause a whole lot of mess. So it's really important that we make sure we load the correct procedure for the runway that's in use. Again, look ahead, uh, anticipate and you know, get the ATIS and you know make sure you've got a, a sense of what you're going to get and make sure that you've loaded what you've actually been cleared for. This ties in quite nicely with my next slide about briefing the arrival. Now I could talk for hours about this. Uh, this is my thing, right? Threat and error management, CRM, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I've only got about 60 seconds because apparently Evan would quite like everybody to still be awake at the end of this. Um, so I'll put some uh, examples in here of things that we should be thinking about, whether um, the approach you're expecting, things like that. But the main thing I will say is uh, I have a friend who used to be a very senior training captain for British Airways. And what he is, always says is, you should be the world expert in the approach 
or departure procedure that you're about to fly. Okay. Uh, so basically nothing should come as a surprise. So when we talk about situation awareness, we build it in blocks and we talk about noticing, understanding, and thinking ahead. And so we need to notice, gather all the information first. We need to understand what that means for us and then think ahead and think about how we can apply that. Try and think about how you're going to fly these procedures. Try and think about contingencies. It's likely that you know what you're, you initially think is, is going to be planned might change. Think about how you will deal with, for example, a change of runway, a change of arrival. How will you program it? What can you do to get ahead to make it easier for yourself? And the other thing I'd say is, look, you've got plenty of time. Use your time during the cruise wisely. Uh, have a look through the pilot brief that you get from uh, your cross from briefing package read through it uh, familiarize yourself with everything that's in there because um, there'll be loads of useful information as i say use your time wisely um, a word about holding, especially into the UK, you can expect that if it's busy, you are going to get holds. Uh, they can be published or unpublished. They can be on the chart or something that ATC has essentially made up. Either way, if you want to program it in and you know that's going to be the easiest way to do it, you're going to need to know the same information. Fundamentally, a fix to hold over, in this case, Bobbingdon. The inbound track of the hold, in this case, 116 degrees. The direction of turns. Uh, so for holding patterns, right hand turns are standard. Uh, so if it's not specified, the direction of turn will be right. Uh, if it's you know left hand turns, that would have to be specified. And the length of the hold, it can be a time or it can be a distance. Again, if it's not specified, the standards are one minute below flight level 140 and a minute and a half above flight level 140. How are we going to pop it in? Uh, something that you should have a look at in advance make sure you know how to do with your aircraft and your fms there's some examples on the screen there of how you could do it in uh, a boeing and an airbus um, aircraft um, do double check if a hold is part of a procedure it's likely that the box will have it, but make sure that it is correct because it's not infallible. Um, and also try and, as I say, think ahead. So if we think about that situation awareness thing. Uh, so we might notice, right? from listening to the radio that other aircraft ahead of us on the same route are being issued a hold, right? So what do we understand from that? We understand that it's likely we might get a hold as well. So thinking ahead, uh, we might, want to uh, load that into the box, maybe not, not execute it at this point, but load it in there so it's ready to go in case we do get issued that hold. And we might also want to think about things like how much fuel do we have? Where's our alternate? How much fuel do we need to get there? Do we need to set up an alternate route to, to our, to our uh, alternate airport or something like that? So you think about, see about how we notice, understand, think ahead, build that situation awareness. Something else you might hear with holding, by the way, if you put into a hold is you might get what's called an EFC, an expected further clearance time. Um, the important thing to know about this is that it is for your planning only. In real life, what it does is it allows us to be a little bit more flexible with our fuel, basically it allows us to, if we know how long the delay is likely to be, it gives us the opportunity potentially to what we call commit to our destination airfield and maybe burn into some of our alternate fuel to stay in the hold for a bit if we know that we're going to get a clearance to leave the hold at a later point. But it is not a clearance to leave the hold at that time. You will only ever be explicitly instructed to leave the hold. Just carry on going. Even if that time comes and goes, we're going to carry on in the hold until we're explicitly told to leave it. It's that magic word, expect. You don't always get what expect. you expect. Exactly. So uh, Rob talks a little about, about SIDS. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stars and some of the phraseology that uh, you might encounter across Europe. So a um, couple of things here. So uh, cleared for the running one X-ray arrival or the never four whiskey transition that we've got here on the screen. What are we expected to do that? basically to follow the lateral and the speed constraints and whatever we do not to descend without ATC clearance, just the lateral portion of it. We might hear something like cleared for the running one X-ray arrival with the runway 04 transition. The transition is going to be the bit that gets us from the end of the star to the initial approach fix or onto the uh, final approach. Again, what are we going to do here? Notice that same uh, kind of phraseology that you heard earlier. We're going to 
follow the lateral and the speed constraints on the star. So we're going to follow the route and the speed, but we're not going to descend without an explicit clearance. Slight difference here, cleared for the nether four whiskey transition and profile, right? So what does that and profile mean? Well, it's an important word because not only now are we cleared to follow the lateral and speed constraints on the transition, the route and the speed, we're also expected to follow the altitude constraints, uh, except we're going to descend no further than the lowest level on the transition, in this case, 3,500 feet. When ready, this is something which uh, sometimes is a bit confusing. Uh, people sort of uh, say that they're, you know, you know, they don't really understand what this means. Uh, and basically, it's really straightforward. It is, as it says on the tin, it's a pilot's discretion instruction. When you are ready to do whatever it is, start your descent, etc., uh, that is when you should start, when it is optimum for you. Um, and the important thing to say here is that it is uh, not the um uh it's not a, a passive aggressive thing it's not atc saying we really think you should be ready now to start your descent uh no you start when you hey, are man. whenever you're ready okay okay exactly <laughs> right um so uh and so if we were clear to descend say flight level uh nine zero by fake here for example um that we would uh descend uh so outside of, and we'll come on to this a little bit more in, in future, um, in, in the next couple of slides, but if we were in Europe, we would start a descent down to flight of 190 and we would follow this uh, these restrictions here. So we'd have to comply with our flight level 130 between flight 100 and 130 and 250 knots at Totley. Um, in the UK, um, we can ignore that and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but mostly we have to uh, follow uh, these instructions when we get a descent. Um, in Europe and South, basically outside the UK, we like being special in the UK. We'll talk more about the UK in a moment, but outside the UK in the rest of the world, uh, you may hear descend via star. So for example, descend via star to flight level seven zero. Um, what are we gonna do? Well, we are going to start our descent immediately because it's not a pilot's discretion, it's not when ready. Um, we need to meet all of our restrictions. So we need to make our flight level uh, 100 to 130 at Totley and our speed of 250 knots. And we're going to send no level and no further than the level that's been given by ATC, in this case, flight level 70. Um, slight variation. Descend via star to flight level 70, cancel the level restriction at Totley. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to bin off that level restriction here. We can ignore that. We still need to make the speed uh, and obviously we're not going to send any further than the flight level 70 we've been cleared for. Descend unrestricted to flight level 70. Again, what are we going to do? We're going to start our descent immediately. We've not heard when ready. Um, we can ignore all of this. We can bin off the altitude restrictions, the speed restrictions, the lot. Obviously, we're only going to descend as far as we've been cleared for for flight level 70. Descend flight level 90 to be leveled by fake, right? Now, you shouldn't really get this outside of the UK. It's not a great instruction because it is ambiguous, right? And this is something which is confusing in real life. It's a big topic of conversation in real life aviation as well. Um, what we should do is we should descend, start a descent immediately to flight level 90 because it's not when ready. Um, but we do need to make sure we meet any of these previous charted restrictions. Uh, and we're going to send to flight level 90. We're going to make sure we're at flight level 90 by this point fake. And we're not going to send any further until we're cleared uh, to do so. In the UK, if we get descend flight level 70, we're going to, again, it's not when ready. So we're going to start down straight away. Um, now, in the UK, any uh, ATC instruction basically overrides any previous clearance or anything that's on the chart. So we bin off these altitudes here. We're just going to descend straight down to flight level 70 if we're in the UK only. We do have to comply with the speed, though. Now, once we've got to the end of the start or the transition, uh, then what are we going to do? Well, uh, we might see something like, uh, 
then on track or on heading or this little chevron line here um so if we see that then basically it's important that we follow that instruction so we're going to follow along that heading on that chevron line until we receive something further uh the most important thing is that we're not going to go off and do our own thing head turn towards the runway something like that be careful about discontinuities here if you ditch them here um and sequence this dl530 with the final approach fix is something people like doing a lot if you do that then what's going to happen when we get here the aircraft's going to turn off and go towards the runway right so leave those discontinuities in if you see something like this um likewise uh the alternatives something like this we might get a clearance limit with a hold at the end of it do not proceed beyond ockham without atc clearance what are we going to do when we get there? If we haven't heard anything else from ATC, we're just going to go into the hold at the level and speed we were cleared for, and we're going to sit there and wait for further instructions. Again, what we're not going to do is go off doing our own thing. Final couple of words about vacating the runway. Uh, really important. We're going to have loads. Of, it's going to be busy, right? You're going to have people behind you. Spacing is going to be quite tight. It's really important that we use the minimum amount of time on the runway that we possibly can. It's worth thinking about this in your briefing. Whereabouts are you going to vacate the runway, right? Uh, plan your braking uh, and plan which side you're going to get off and where you're going to go so that you know in advance it's not a surprise and you can brake nice and efficiently to get off at the taxiway that you want to vacate on really important we don't stop on the runway you're going to really upset the guy behind you when he has to go around um once we're clear of the runway so we need to be over the whole short line we're going to stop and we're going to expect taxi instructions from atc in general there might be some variations to this depending on the airfield that you're arriving at the details will be in your airport brief but the main thing is we're going to occupy the runway for the least possible amount of time, right? Frodo says, get off the, run the, the runway, right? Uh, or uh, I used to, when I was at university some years ago, uh, my what now wife, then girlfriend, used to live with a Finnish girl uh, who had a wonderful turn of phrase and playing Mario Kart used to say, get off the way! <laughs> get off the way. <laughs> Watch a shell at your butt, but it's going to be in the shape yeah. of a true seven. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> So once we've got off the way, uh, a thought about your taxi. And again, really good. Include this in. Use your time in the cruise when you've got your feet up and it's quiet and you've not got anything to do to think about where you're going to go after you've vacated the runway. Where are you going to park? How are you going to get there? Look through the charts. See if there's any standard directions. For example, we you know here at Amsterdam, there you can see that um, the taxiway is a unidirectional, right? So taxiway alpha, you can see, goes in a sort of clockwise direction. Taxiway bravo goes anti-clockwise. Be aware of that, right? Because it's likely that if you're given, you know, taxi via alpha, ATC are going to expect that you're going to follow, yeah, you're going to know which direction that's going to be. Uh, you can expect a stand to be assigned, as with everything, if you can't accept it, let ATC know as soon as possible. And again, be prepared for the fact that you might be, it's going to be busy, it's going to be congested. You might have to stop and give way or hold at intermediate points. Again, just keep that situation awareness, have your chart up in front of you, follow it along and make sure that we're following what's on the chart and not necessarily those taxiway signs in the SIM if the SIM is different to the chart. And that is just about it from me. So uh, I'm going to throw it back to Rob for uh, some final tips. All right, all right, back to me. Okay, um, a lot of what we've covered so far today is applicable anytime you fly on the network, really. But here are some uh, tips and tricks that are specifically geared toward the cross the pond event. All right. Um, so first of all, every airport involved in the event is going to have a pilot briefing. Um, you're going to find those at the ctp.vatsim.net website. And this is the same website where you book your slot. So go to your booking. You should find the links to the briefing briefings for your origin and your destination. Every airport's got some unique quirks. These briefings are gonna help you know what to watch out for at those locations. They might even have scenery recommendations, freeware and payware in some cases, so you can make sure your airport layout is in the sim is as up to date as possible and hopefully avert that situation I described earlier where the taxiway letters don't match up with what's on the charts. That same CTP website is gonna contain your route. You don't have to do any route planning at all. You just have to use the one that they send you. I don't think they actually, when I say send, I don't think they actually email them out anymore, but you uh, can just log into the 
uh, the booking site uh, the, the night before or the morning of and use the route that they provide there. Um, don't just pull down a route from Simbri for Flight Aware. It might not be the same route that they want you to use for traffic management purposes for this event. I have said before, but I'll say it again, um, make sure you have charts for the departure procedure, the arrival procedure, and the approach that you're flying. Just punching it into the FMC is only half the job. Um, you're going to also want taxiway and terminal charts uh, with gate numbers preferably handy for both your departure and your arrival airport. And consider updating your nav data if uh, you don't already do that regularly. Big tip is to bring extra fuel, a couple hours worth if you can, because you might get taxi delays, you might get uh, holds airborne, you might get vectored for traffic, you might not get your optimal cruise altitude. That's the most efficient one. You, you might get stuck at a lower cruise level where you're, you're not quite so fuel efficient. So don't get caught short. If you start running low on fuel, you are not going to get pushed to the front of the line. Trust me. Uh, do not try to... Oh, let's see. Hold on. Yep. Uh, we skipped one. Um, Hang on a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the uh, connection time that you want to use is approximately 45 minutes before your slot time. Um, connect 45 minutes uh, before that CTOT, which is calculated takeoff time, and you would have planned to push 20 minutes prior to that time. However, in the pilot briefing for your origin airport, um, it may say something slightly different than this. It might be adjusted a little sooner, a little later. Go by the guidance that's in that pilot briefing for your origin airport. However, these are some good general guidelines just for your planning purposes um, in, the, in, the, in the coming days before. But that pilot briefing for your origin is going to uh, have maybe some specifics that might be slightly different than this. This is going to be a, uh, this is going to put you in the ballpark. All right. Here's where I, I, I left off. Um, try not to jump on to tech. Now, if, you, if you're using text as a normal basis, that's fine. But try not, if you're on voice, don't use text or don't use private messages to try and get the controller's attention if they're very, very busy and they haven't gotten to you and you're just trying to jump into the conversation. Because uh, that's not going to help. It's only going to make things worse. When the controllers get really, really busy, it becomes more difficult to manage the private messages in the text chat, not less difficult. So you're really only going to complicate matters by uh, by trying to do that. Just stay on voice and just jump in when you can. Uh, listen out for a gap in between exchanges and, and jump in then. Uh, and then finally, pay attention. Listen out for your call sign, especially if it's not a call sign that you use regularly. A good tip is to write it down, a piece of masking tape or something, post-it note, stick it up on your monitor where you can see it. That's, um, you know, in real airline ops, by the way, they told you to um, hold sterile cockpit below 10,000 feet. And that is, you know, that's probably the time you want to turn off your Taylor Swift. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, write, <laughs> write that down. Stick it on your monitor there. Um, but yeah, below 10,000, you might want to turn off the Taylor Swift jams and, and be listening out for your call sign. All right, finally, I want to note that Cross the Pond is the busiest event Vatsun puts on all year. Controllers are stretched to their maximums workload wise. You don't want to do anything that's going to add to their workload. Be on your A game, bring your best, do what you can to help the event go smoothly. That being said, if there's something that you didn't quite catch or didn't understand, that's the time that you want to go ahead, be that person, ask for a repeat or an explanation. It takes a controller less time to repeat or explain a command than it does to fix a flow disruption that got completely messed up by somebody who didn't understand something and just plowed ahead with whatever they thought was their best guess. So asking for clarification if you miss something, you're saving the controller time in the long run. Other than that, do try to limit anything that you're going to do to add to their workload. I'm going to leave you with this page. It's a page we put together with some additional resources, and you can check these out in the coming week to make sure that you're as ready as possible. But at this point, I shall turn you back over to Flight Sim Association co-founder Evan Ryder. Evan, all you. Thank you so much, uh, Rob, Simon, and everyone, really, for the uh, great chat. I've been enjoying answering your questions, reading your comments, and I will enjoy speaking with uh, probably if, at least a few of you, whether you're in the Boston area. I haven't been told which position I'll be working yet, but I'll be working for sure next weekend on Saturday for Cross the Pond. So hopefully we'll we'll talk to you guys on voice, if not uh, somewhere else between now and then. Uh, lots of fun comments, questions, jokes. I guess we'll start off with a joke from Scotty Bob 64 who says, Bono and the Edge walk into a bar and the bar tender goes not you too again <laughs> yeah i know i debated whether i should say that one and the mg king from youtube says for me the hardest part of flying in the u.s is knowing how to pronounce the waypoints it's a fair point i think sports teams is a good one there if you're ever unsure it's probably a sports team 
my right. experience. Yeah. I think you, gotta be up, you have to be up on every city's pop culture references. That's right. To fly into it. Yes. Yeah. I like at least in the U.S. the points are like something though, whereas like in the rest of the world they're just like some random amalgamation of letters that you're like, well, I know how to say it, but what does it mean? You know. Yeah, we used to have a few in the UK that were a bit uh, that that's that, you know, and there still are a few that are still there that sort of you know like locations or if you fly into Liverpool, if you're a Liverpool soccer fan, you will notice that there is a point called Keegan, uh, Kevin Keegan, uh, right, and things like that. Uh, but yeah, they have now. I, I think the uh, the the, guy, the guys at IKO have taken all the fun out of it and said you've got to use <laughs> the FAA still thinks they are very funny. So all of, a lot of the US <laughs> procedures, it's it's not just the individual points, but the string of points often yeah. has some sort of funny meaning. And the, uh, the FAA does think they're quite hilarious. Yeah. And we also have a, a live picture of our audience here as well. <laughs> yeah. courtesy of that is our live. That, that is the live studio yeah. audience in Studio Five, just outside of Ocean City, Maryland. So Aww. that's <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we are, as as I promised, we are going to answer some questions now. So Rob and Simon are here to answer your questions. Wherever you're watching, you can drop a question right in the chat. If you're on FSA, put it in our Discord. You can send me an email. I'll look at that. And if you are in the Cross the Pond Discord, and I've linked that up on the screen there, just ctp net slash discord there's a channel called ctp discussion i am watching that channel for any of your questions so fire those in we're going to answer questions kind of starting with the general event then i'll talk about the oceanic stuff and then we'll get into the arrival just the same order that we did for the live presentation and rob we'll start with the question that a number of people have asked which is just around uh how do i get a slot if i don't have one yet how can i get a slot if i still want to participate in the event Gotcha. Just generally speaking, there was a registration for interest that was a two week period at the end of September, beginning of October. So um, keep in mind for future cross the pond events that about maybe a month, six weeks out, you want to be looking uh, at all the social media sources to, to for the announcement of when that's going to happen. For this time around, you've missed the boat on that. However, all hope is not yet lost. Um, what, hap what has happened this past week is uh, everybody that had those booking appointments staggered out uh, across the entire week have all kind of had their appointments. A, a good number of slots are gone. There are still a few handful that are remaining as of today. Um, in the days leading up to the event, everyone has to get back onto that site and reconfirm. Essentially, that's the that's the final check. Did the wife clear you to, to sit in front of your computer all day? Did you miss? Did you didn't forget about uh, soccer practice or something that you're supposed to be at? So there's a few slots are going to get dropped here and there. And then if people forget or neglect to go back to the website and hit that reconfirm button, those slots are going to get released back to the wind as well. That release, I'm told, is going to be happening on the 26th, which is two days out from the event. Um, they have not published a specific time that that release is going to happen. I think they said somewhere around 1800 Zulu, but that's just that's the, the general plan. But again, stay on top of the social media, the announcements pages in the Discord for CTP. That sims uh, announcements. Uh, probably, I think the CTP has a whether, whether you refer to it as Twitter or X, it, that's they're on that platform there, and they'll be announcing that kind of stuff. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, keep keep on top of that, and they will let you know exactly what time those unreconfirmed slots are going to be released out to the pool. Um, but the twenty sixth, sometime you know, mid late afternoon is when you want to be looking because that's when it's supposed to happen. Perfect. And can you talk to the actual routes in the event? If you have a slot, you're flying between the airports. How do you know what waypoints to fly? Yeah, the, well, like uh, I mentioned um, just a couple slides ago, the route that they want you to fly is going to be sent to you, or at, I, I keep saying sent to you. I don't think they do email them out anymore, but if you just go back to that very same website, it basically becomes the hub for the event, ctp.vatsim.net, same website that you re registered your interest, same website that you voted for the airports that you wanted, same website that you you know picked up your slot or that you're going to pick up a slot on the 26th, that same booking portal is going to have the route uh, probably about 12 hours before the event starts is when those routes are going to be uh, uploaded to that site and you just pull it right straight up right up from there and paste it into whatever your own planning resources are on your side don't fly just a regular sim brief route from from a to b it might be different the, the, the traffic situation for vats and cross the pond is very different than the real world traffic situation um in a normal you know uh, atlantic crossing so go by the routes that the, the event planners have put into that portal and uh, either rob or simon do you want to speak to just how this event 
comes to be? Like, how do they pick the airports? How do they pick the city pairs? Sure. So um, the airports and city pairs are um, essentially picked by you, right? By VATSIM, uh, VATSIM users. So uh, every year, uh, a couple of um, a month or two before the event, the um, there's some some you know each division that wants to take part in cross the pond puts forward some airports that they would like to be involved with the event and then uh those are then released to the public for a vote and then the most essentially the most popular airports that have been voted for by the rats in public are then used for um for the event so yeah it's a it's a really kind of community oriented thing in that sense and can you speak to yeah, and then what, they oh, do sorry, have to make up. some adjustments to that. I'm sorry, yeah, I mean to cut you off, Evan. They do have to make some adjustments to that because if if the top nine vote getting airports are all in Germany, for example, well, that airspace situation is not going to work. So they they get to a certain point where certain pieces of the airspace are saturated, then they they have to end up skipping further down the uh, the list. But but yeah, in general, they try to go by what was uh, what was voted on to the best of their ability. Uh, sort of related to that, how does air traffic control staffing work? Do they online the entire time? Do they stagger the facilities? How do they work? What time can I expect ATC to show up? So basically, you can expect ATC for, you know, if you've got a slot booked, you would expect that you would have ATC for your route all the way across from your point of view as a pilot, right? So um, the times for which that ATC will be rostered will be, um, arranged by each facility based on when they expect the traffic to, you know, the first traffic to arrive, essentially. So, and a little bit before, and a little bit after. Um, so uh, it will be um, arranged essentially for that event duration. Perfect. Yeah. When you take off um, from the U S you know, your European controllers at your arrival are probably not online yet. So um, the, the staffing is going to basically track the, the route as just as the pilots do. Yeah, question from Simon. Is there a way for non-event traffic, so people flying domestically, to access the pilot briefing? This would be for someone who wants to fly domestically from one of the event airports, and I can speak to this one. Typically, Cross the Pond does not publish the pilot briefings. They're specific to the people with slots, so if you have a slot, you go into the pilot dashboard. That's where you'll access the briefing for your airport. However, some individual facilities, mine included, we will publish the pilot briefing because from our perspective at Boston, the information is great for everybody. There's no secrets in there. It's just great tips for anyone who's flying in and out of our airport any day of the week. And so for us, you'll be able to find it on our website. Our controllers will have a link to our pilot briefing in their controller information. So you will may be able to find some of them here and there, but in terms of you know more broad distribution officially, the Cross the Pond team at this point does not distribute the pilot briefings except to those people who have a booking or a slot lot uh that's all we have for yeah, the general and, any, sorry, any comments on that oh, guys yeah yeah i was just going to say and actually that is a really good point as well in general terms uh that a really good way to prepare yourself better for your flights on the network you know across the board is to take a look at the uh, facility website vacc rtac etc uh, and have a look to see if they've published some pilot briefings and pilot information for you know when you're flying into their airspace because quite often there is information there and it's really handy stuff and it really makes the controllers lives easier if you're across all of that stuff so yeah try and get into the habit of just taking a look uh, seeing if these there's some information published because you might be pleasantly surprised yeah, and you know, it just actually speaks well to a comment that Benny made on the FSA Discord about, you know, you can start now, but even as you get the pilot briefing, maybe the day before, have a look at the airports that you're flying out of. Like, if you've never operated out of Boston and that's your departure airport, maybe spawn in there. Have a look around the taxiways. Do the labels match up? Does the airport match what you see on the charts? Like, just, just a little bit of familiarization can help. And then as we get closer, once the route comes out, once the pilot briefing is available to you, you know, you could almost, I'm not saying, you know, pre-fly a whole flight, but you could do a departure or just even single player mode or on the network when one of our controllers are on just to give you that familiarity you know even in real life when we fly into an airport for the first time it's just confusing it's overwhelming there's just just hard to know where exactly you're supposed to go then you've been there a couple times and you're like ah this is a piece of cake now so if you have the opportunity to you know practice stuff it just makes things that much smoother on the day of uh, moving to Oceanic stuff now. So Victor asks, will you be able to request the Oceanic clearance via voice if you want to? Um, I believe you 
I mean, I, I believe you probably will be able to. The preference is that you request it via NAT track because basically it makes everybody's life a whole lot easier, right? Because when you request it via voice, um, a, uh, a, an oceanic delivery controller is going to take that, transcribe that information, uh, put it all into the system. Uh, it's all going to ch kind of chug around and then, you know, they've got to come back with uh, with an answer for you and, and stuff like that. So it does increase the workload. If you know, you had an issue with that track, I, you know, I imagine there will be some um, provision for voice. If I'm not right about that, let me know. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm that, that very much the strong preference is that um, certainly that uh, you know, to, to get that clearance over over that track. Yeah, yeah just, and to, just to add right to around. that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think if you as a pilot flying in your first cross the pond event are asking, may I do this? May I do that? A good question to ask yourself before seeking the answer to that question is, is what I'm asking going to increase the controller's workload? If yeah. the answer is probably yes, the answer is you probably shouldn't be doing it then. Yeah, and then that that question, obviously, with respect to oceanic clearances, that was for the North Atlantic. So just to be clear, Flightboy737 asks, right. there are no oceanic clearances for the South Atlantic. Is that correct? That's correct. So uh, the only um, airspace that we need to get a specific clearance through that track for is uh, Gander and Reykjavik, uh, essentially, because obviously we're flying uh, flying eastbound. So you won't, you know, those would be the facilities that you'd come into first. Uh, everything else. So New York Oceanic deal, you know, deal with it behind the scenes, um, as do all of the other South Atlantic uh, airspaces. So it's all kind of coordinated by, behind the scenes with your um ifr flight plan you will be given a, a level and a mac number to fly however perfect i don't know if this is officially talked about but people every now and again somebody wants to go westbound so they go you know the opposite direction to cross the pond do you know if that's going to be officially supported this year and do people get their clearance through you know nat track as well i'm not actually sure uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, generally speaking, in the past, it hasn't been supported, so yeah. uh, you generally tend not to, you know, get very much, shall we say? There was a conversation to that effect in the Ask the Planning Team channel in the uh, the Cross the Pond Discord, and the answer was no. Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Really, the idea is like, if you want to fly somewhere and you're not an event airplane, please do it domestically and just don't even go over the ocean. And that would make everyone's lives just so much easier. Uh, cell Cal, you question do, about you're cell not going to get ATC services. Yeah. Question about Cell Cal from Belichu. I think I hope I pronounced that okay. Is Cell Cal something that's built into vPilot or do we have to download some add on in order for it to work? No, exactly. So cell call is built into your pilot client, into vPilot, xPilot, and all of the other clients. I hope, yeah, I'm sure it is. All, all um, one of the other pilot. <laughs> yeah, all one of the other ones. Yeah, so it's it's built in. So all you need is your pilot client. As I say, um, there will be an option in the connection dialog there to enter your cell call code that you've been assigned by the you know, when you get your cross the pond route briefing uh, as i say really important that you use the cell call code that you've been assigned for cross the pond make sure you put it in there and make sure you have it in your flight plan uh, as well remarks as well uh, is the other thing to uh, to say but definitely make sure you have it in the connection window otherwise uh, it won't work uh, and what will happen is that you'll get um when you receive a cell call, your pilot client, your vPilot window will basically flash and it will um, make a make a noise. It will make a chime. Um, useful little tip on that, by the way. So um, one of the things that people often wonder about is how you can split the audio out uh, for vPilot. And I'm sure this is the same with xPilot as well. So, for example, if you've got the uh, comms through your headset, uh, how can you make the cell call ping, for example, come through your loudspeakers? Um, and the answer is that uh, vPilot sounds, so like cell call pings, um, the text message sound that you get, private message alerts, things like that, uh, are played through the default Windows audio device. Um, whereas you can select where your voice communications go through when you, if you go into the vPilot settings. So the way to do it would be to set your default Windows audio device to your speakers and then to go into the vPilot settings and then select obviously your headset um, for 
or your headset output or for the voice communications. And that way you'll get all your vPilot sounds come out of your speakers and your radio communications will be in your headset. So when you get over the Atlantic, you can take your headset off, um, but you'll still get any alerts, private message pings, cell call alerts, etc. Uh, we're going to ask a bunch of CPDL questions in a second. So any any of the CPDLC stuff, please ask it now. A uh, question about the arrival process. I know in Europe, oftentimes stands or parking spots will be assigned by ATC. And so are they going to be assigning those reflecting the fact that there's wide bodies? And how do we help controllers given the fact that everyone's got flying a wide body and obviously not all stands can support that necessarily? Yeah, so... Uh, what generally happens uh, nowadays, and obviously it, every facility is going to have a slightly different way of doing this, but generally speaking, um, controllers in Europe have got um, plugins in their controller clients uh, that will automatically assign stands. And they're pretty clever, right? So they understand the aircraft type that's in the flight plan and they understand your airline uh, based on the airline, like the call sign that you use, and they will generally send you to uh, an available stand that is that fits your aeroplane and that is at the right parking location for your airline obviously um there is some uh room for maneuver within that because for example you know especially across the pond you might be flying into an airport that you know isn't served by that airline in real life and things like that uh so there is some some flexibility in there but generally speaking that again it, it would generally kind of fall back to make sure it's, it gives you a, a suitably sized stand uh if not necessarily a 100 percent accurate location type of, on the airport type of thing um but yeah it, it, so in general it will work it works pretty well and it will know also whether stands are occupied as well so it will only assign you a, a free stand again sometimes that you know, obviously people can log on in the meantime between you know the system assigning you a stand and and you getting that so again that sort of stuff can change a little bit or you know can be updated by the controller but generally as long as you've got the right aircraft type in your flight plan um the automated assignment will be pretty close there most of the time. And controllers are also really good at knowing uh, generally where, um, you, what can park where. Um, having said that, and, and uh, Rob mentioned as well also in the presentation about the importance of disconnecting once you've uh, once you've landed to free up the gates, which is really important so that uh, the next aircraft can then you know get in there and you, you don't end up with like, loads of congestion on the ground. Um, so yeah, generally it, it's pretty good. Uh, obviously if you get something that you, and, and I would say as well, um, bear in mind it is a, a really busy event and the traffic uh, profile in terms of chucking a whole load of wide bodies into uh, airports at a greater volume than they usually would be in real life, for example, you know, is a slight, you know, it, it, it's not quite as it would be in real life. So I would say, try and be flexible, maybe try, you know, it, you know, try to um, accept that, you know, you might, you know, for the, for the sake of the event, you might have to accept something which isn't necessarily 100% accurate and 100% realistic. It's kind of it, it's a bit you know within the nature of of how that sim sometimes is in those those situations. But if you can't accept something, as always, uh, just speak to the controller and say, Do you know what, actually that uh, gate, you know, I, I can't accept that gate or that taxi route because it's you know my aircraft's too wide for you know, to the, 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 the taxiway code. Um, can I have such and such? You know, as always, if you're going to say unable, it's great if you've got a plan to propose as right. well it's good customer service don't tell them what you can't do tell them what you can do exactly uh, the other thing is you don't need to linger i mean as much as, as it's a huge event it's a great event it's a lot of fun to continue to watch the traffic come in okay great disconnect your pilot client reconnect as an observer stay around watch that way for a little bit that way you're not physically occupying that gate and somebody else can use it yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, I want to ask a bunch of um, various CPDLC, PDC type questions, and this is complicated, and I appreciate that because it does depend on the airport, the facility, the country, where you are. So there are all kinds of different. So, acronyms this is all out. you. I'm going to go put, put my Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would do the same. Yeah. yeah. So out of the United States, and I think generally most of Canada, uh, we don't really simulate PDC. Uh, sorry, CPDLC, and that's true of real life, and that's true of the network as well. So in the United States, for sure out of almost every departure facility, you're 
clearance is going to come via a private message from a thing called ACARS. It probably won't come from the clearance delivery controller. It's going to come from ACARS, but it will be a private message. It is not going to appear in your hobby client. It is not going to appear in your airplane. There's no integration for that yet. There may be at some stage in the future, but that does not exist on VATSIM at this stage. Now, you get going, there's typically in the US no CPDLC en route. So you're just talking via voice, it's as simple as that. That's the US departure portion, you know, mostly sorted out. Now, moving into Oceanic, Simon, I'm gonna lean on you a little bit here. So in the North Atlantic, you know, we don't really use CPDLC, we use NatTrack, which is kind of CPDLC, right? So that's how you're getting your Oceanic yeah. clearance. That's all happening more or less textually. And then after that, there's really no more en route CPDLC there. You're just checking on doing your cell cal check. Is that correct? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. See, I was paying attention. That's good. And then it's really not until you move into like Europe and Africa sort of domestic centers, that's where you're going to see the CPDLC usage in more of an integrated way. So that's where the Hoppy client is going to work. The airplane is going to, if it's integrated, be able to get those messages. That doesn't exist in the departure phase, but it will exist in your arrival phase. Is that fair to say? Exactly right. Yep, exactly that. Perfect. All right. So now CPDLC, when I say CPDLC, it means all of that. Okay. So um, the question yeah. from Anders or Anders maybe in the Vatsum Discord is like, is CPDLC mandatory or can you more or less get away without it? Uh, no, it's not mandatory. Uh, you can absolutely get away without it. Um, but it is, uh, so it's, it's something that's worth exploring. The reason I say that is because, as I mentioned, uh, the great thing about it is it does help reduce uh, some of the frequency congestion, which makes it obviously easier to get a word in edgeways when you want to check in. It makes it easier to uh, get those important messages out. As I say, you know, if, um, you know, ATC need to, um, get in touch with you uh, to give you some avoiding action or some sort of really, you know, urgent transmission. If the frequency is clearer because some of those routine transmissions, things like frequency changes, directs, that sort of stuff are kind of taken out of the voice realm and, and are transmitted over CPDLC, uh, that can kind of, you know, it can, can help uh, ATC and it can help ATC be a little bit more efficient as well because they typically will have integration on their side. So if you're not a controller, you may uh, not be aware that um, when a controller gives you an instruction, what they will do is they will update your data tag on their screen with the instruction that they've given you. So uh, they'll tell you to climb flight level 360, uh, and then they'll have to go into your data tag, update it so that it says, you know, you're cleared to flight level 360, you're cleared direct this waypoint or that waypoint or on this heading or whatever it might be. Um, and so uh, because they've got to do that anyway, typically a CPDLC integration on the ATC side means that they just update your tag and it bang, pings off a message. And then once uh, it'll probably change your um, their tag a different color whilst, you know, until you've acknowledged it. And then once you've acknowledged it, it'll, you know, go back to its its normal color or something like that so that they can see uh, that that instruction's been sent and received. So you can see how actually that kind of integrates into the controller's workflow really uh, easily and enables them to actually be quite quick about you know dealing with lots more traffic so it does help increase capacity in a lot of cases for uh, atc but no it's it's not mandatory and a question from it's a short <laughs> answer <laughs> yeah very short a question from the rob is like four songs in his taylor swift album over there a question from benny would be is voice contact required before i check on when i check on in cpdlc or simultaneously how does that work uh yes so yes is the short answer to that so yes so uh voice uh, is always the primary means of communication so that means we have to check in on voice uh, and we have to keep monitoring the frequency we have to keep a headset on listening across listening to uh for our call sign listening for any transmissions that might come to us but it's not a um log on to cbdlc headset off feet up taylor swift on right um so um yeah, voice. So we always need to establish voice communications by checking in and we always need to keep listening. But um, yeah, it should be a bit quite easier to keep listening because it should be a little bit quieter if people are using CPDLC. Perfect. And then I think I've got most of the questions. So if I missed your question, uh, wherever you're at, please repost it so I didn't miss it. I have one more question about fuel, but if I've missed anything else, please do repost that so I make sure that we get everybody here. Questions from CSX fan on the Vatsim YouTube channel. How much extra fuel do you recommend we bring for Across the Pond? 
how long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, I would say, I mean, so here, so here's the things that, and Rob, you know, but please, you know, chip in and and give your thoughts on this. Um, now, I would say things that you would, I would think about in terms of bringing extra fuel. Right, firstly, how long do you want to hang around holding for? Right, you don't have to finish up at you know the planned destination. Right, if you don't want to sit in a hold for three hours. And it probably won't be that long, but you know, you, you get what I'm saying. If you if you don't want to sit in a hold for three hours, you don't need to take three hours of holding fuel. You can just divert and go somewhere else, right? Um, but obviously, you know, it would be wise to take, you know, you know, it, it, given that most of us generally want to reach our destination, and in real life, if we're an airline, passengers tend to quite like us getting to our uh, that where they want to go as opposed to some other airport. Um, I would say, uh, I think Rob mentioned in the briefing at, at least an hour or so extra. I would think that's a good figure to start with. Um, you can get into some fun stuff with fuel planning, right? Because especially on long haul with wide body aircraft, um, you, you might actually need to load more than an hour of extra fuel before you depart because you will burn some of that on route so if you load uh you know and it, the typical figure is about three percent per hour so if you've done an eight hour flight uh you will have burned uh you know a, a whole bunch of extra so you might need to load actually an extra hour and a half's worth of fuel before you depart to arrive with an hour's worth of holding fuel <laughs> um so yeah do take uh, i'd say at least a, at least an hour or so you could take more you could take a little bit less i would you know say you know do take, you know, enough to cope with, you know, a, a, a comfortable amount of holding. You may get a bit of a reroute. You may be held at a slightly lower, less than optimum level than you would like. And taxi delays might be significant. So I would say also not only take some extra fuel for holding, but make sure your taxi time, you know, the amount of fuel to take the taxi is realistic as well. Perfect. A uh, question from Benji, actually, that I forgot to mention earlier. Good one. What's the recommendation if internet drops and we need to sort of reconnect a minute or two downstream? What do you recommend for that? So the, the planning team has basically said, if you are able to kind of restart the flight from somewhere near you where you left off, then that's fine. Um, so that might be, you know, departing from a close airport going back up to where you were, you know, in time lapse while not connected to the VASM network and then, you know, reconnecting from there. Or if you've got some sort of a saving tool that you can restart your flight. So the, the key thing is though, you want to reconnect and in a fashion that's not going to disrupt whatever traffic is there. So it's just checking back in with the controller, letting them know what happened, being willing to accept their guidelines on how they have to then work you back into the flow in a different spot than where you were when the disruption happened. So just, you're able to do it, but just do it in a flexible manner. Be willing to work with the controllers, and the controllers should be willing to work with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really situational. Like we at Boston, we actually have a procedure. If on the ground you've been disconnected or your simulator has crashed, we actually ask you to respawn at a particular place, and that way you're not going to have to start the whole process again. We can actually just work with you right away. If it's in the air, obviously the best case scenario is your internet just drops. Just keep going. Don't pause your sim. Don't do anything. Make sure you keep progressing, and then you can just reconnect, and you'll be you know in the same spot in the line. That's very easy for us to handle. But then the challenges will my simulator's crashed and if you don't have a, a kind of saving tool now it's very difficult because we have to you know get you back into the line and that may be challenging depending on where you're at but yeah i mean do the best that you can as rob has said those are good guidelines and hopefully you know the worst case scenario of that sim crash and you can't get back to where you were that's the really challenging one but if it's just you know momentary internet lapse but you've kept progressing exactly where you were and you're just reconnecting that's usually not a problem and then you know just check in with the controller and be prepared to just be patient if we need to you know give you a quick spin or something like that but we do our best to try to accommodate because we know stuff happens yeah good point good distinction because if you disappear from a hole but you're moving you're still moving along with that hole and then you reappear in that hole it really shouldn't be that big a deal yeah um and okay i guess we have one more question from benny in our discord which is what is your favorite taylor swift song rob or you could both answer simon if you want to answer as look, well all right look you knew i was trouble when i walked in right i'm uh, sorry are you answering the question or are you just making a statement i'm just shaking oh. off yeah, yeah so you know haters gonna hate man what are you gonna say so i haven't gotten an answer yet what's your, what's your favorite song rob I, 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 
you know what? Those are the two Taylor Swift songs that I know. Oh gosh. <laughs> oh, to gosh. answer as jokes. So you're you've you've exhausted my library of Taylor Swift knowledge right there. Okay. So neither of you have an answer. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll, I'll go shake it off. Go on. Okay. Well, actually, uh, you know, all right, all right. I have a serious answer to that question because there is a third Taylor Swift song that I just heard. It's one of her newer ones, "Antihero," which I think is actually quite yes, profound. Yes. I like that. Very, one. very, very, very poppy. I like that one. If I, I like a lot of her older stuff, like uh, "You Belong with Me" and an "Our Song." Like that's my thing. If anyone's asking me, but no one's asking me, so that's fine. Well, now uh, you're running circles around my Taylor Swift now. So. <laughs> All right. Well, friends, this has been great. Thank you both so much for taking the time to put this on. And, you know, we had the rehearsal session a couple of days ago. I know how much work you guys put into this, and I'm sure the pilots appreciate it. We're really, as a network, I think, just trying to do more outreach to pilots. Like, we know there's a lot of great pilots out there who spend a lot of time and effort to prepare themselves. And there's the odd person out there, to be honest, who just comes in the network, does no practice, has probably never flown their simulator before, right? And they just don't get the level of realism that we're all going for. So for those of you who are here and watching and taking this seriously, thank you. It makes such a difference to our experience as air traffic controllers on the network when pilots take things seriously. And yeah, we can make mistakes. You can ask questions. That's all part of the experience. But at the end of the day, it's if we're learning, we're taking that sort of serious mentality, that works really well. And we as controllers certainly appreciate that. And I appreciate you guys for taking the time to do this. And again, thanks to the audience. Great chat, great questions. If you have more questions in the Cross the Pond Discord, you can post those anytime time there's an ask the planning team section that uh, they'll get an official answer you can use the discussion channels as well and just before we wrap up uh, rob simon anything else you guys want to say rob you can maybe tell people where they can find you on twitch simon if you have anything else you would like to speak to from the vats and pilot training world uh, give you guys the chance to do that and we'll wrap up well uh, thank you evan for the opportunity to be part of this i know that this is like i said this is the fourth time uh, I, I i didn't mean to become a staple of this event but i'm uh, <laughs> pleased to participate every time and and uh, those that know me from from my time on the vatsim network from prior to the live stream i was involved with that star so i've always been very committed to the idea of helping pilots learn what they need to do in order to fly on this uh, network realistically and 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 improve their knowledge uh, it's a learning hobby man if you if you stop learning then you stop stop breathing basically so you know, it, it's something that I've been passionate about for a long, long time. And I appreciate you allowing me to continue to be a part of this. Anytime, Rob. Thanks again. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just to uh, echo Rob's thoughts there as well. Yeah. Thanks ever so much for uh, having me along for uh, this edition, Evan. It's been, uh, it's been great fun and uh, yeah, hopefully um, who knows, maybe I'll be invited back at some point. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, and, and thanks to everybody who's watched as well. It's been uh, great to answer the questions and to, as Evan says, really, you know, as, as as a pilot training department, you know, we're trying to kind of do a bit more outreach and reach, you know, and, and you know, both to talk about some of the stuff that we're doing and also to uh, get, you know, more information and help, you know, and support out there for pilots. You know, I'm very aware that, you know, there's a lot of people that are very keen to learn and to improve. And, you know, some of the resources that, you know, we've, that we've had available in the past haven't been a bit thin on the ground. It's been kind of right. Oh, well, go and do some Googling or watch a YouTube video or something like that, which is, is great. But, you know, there are things that we can definitely do to support that more. And that's what I'm trying to work on from a pilot training point of view. We've got loads of stuff coming along in terms of we're trying to improve, in, increase the amount of um, ACOs, authorized training organizations, so more people can have access to really properly structured training uh, and kind of development material, gain your pilot ratings, all of that kind of good stuff. Um, uh, we're trying to, we're working on some uh, outreach stuff, which I know, uh, Evan, you may know Brandon uh, Waning, who's been involved yeah. in VAT USA and also the VAT, uh, the, the VAT, the PTD. It's looking at putting together some material that we're going to be pushing out uh, over the coming weeks and months. Um, and there's, yeah, so there's loads of, uh, and, and, and also we've got some good stuff coming in terms of pilot feedback. I know this is something which, you know, a lot of controllers have been really keen to um, see. And, and across the network, pilots as well across the network have been keen to, you know, get some, you know, proper feedback going and, and some processes for dealing with that. We've had some real technical advancements with that in the, in the last few weeks. So that's something that we hope to be kind of rolling out on a wider basis soon uh, so we can really provide more support and more um, information and, and help out more people who are keen to get involved in the network, who are keen to learn. And 
as as Rob says, you know, right, you know, I'm still learning stuff, you know, a quarter of a century on, whatever, you know, we're all, you know, um, you know, a good pilot's always learning, right? So um, there's stuff that I don't know that I've taken away from today um, and from, you know, other sessions, right? So, um, you know, uh, so the, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great thing. It's a great thing to be involved in. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to, and, and also I should just say, just finally, because I've wanged on, or, you know, enough now, but um, uh, just finally, if, you know, I'm always available is something I would always say, you know, look, um, you know, you can reach me through my VATSIM email address is on the VATSIM website. Um, you can reach me through the various kind of VATSIM Discord channels I sort of tend to hang around in and things like that. You know, if you've got comments, suggestions, there's things you want to get involved in or, you know, whatever it might be, if there's anything I can do to help you out, if you want to start an ATO, if you want to help, it, you know, deliver pilot training, if you've got any questions, you know, fire them at me. I'm here at your disposal. And uh, yeah, I'm always keen to hear from people and to to engage with people. So, you know, do... Uh, Use me. <laughs> Good deal. Well, thank you again, uh, Rob and Simon, to the Vatsum Cross the Pond team for putting this whole event together for Slant Alpha Adventures, which is Rob for Vatsum, the Pilot Club, and Sky Blue Radio for helping us share today's live stream. And to all of you for watching, participating in the chat, hope to hear some of your voices on Saturday, a week from today, during Cross the Pond, domestic, oceanic, wherever you are. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next Saturday.